Uh, my name's Mark Thomas. I'm primarily a committer on the Apache Tomcat project, but I've also taken on a few other roles at the ASF um, over the years, um, involved in commons, Dubbo, um, helped out on infrastructure, and probably most importantly for this, I'm one of the foundation directors. And in the role of director, one of the things we do is Apache projects report every three months on the current state of their project. And as a director, there are a number of things that when I read in a report a particular phrase or a particular description, it generally comes with a, oh no, here we go again. And the purpose of this talk is to try and share some of those ideas, some idea of the sorts of things that tend to act as warning signs for us, for open source projects that are perhaps heading in the wrong direction or heading towards some sort of trouble. So, Apache's got a wide range of projects. Depending on how you count it, it's 200, 250. And some of those are struggling. Uh, some are doing very well, some are very healthy, some not so much. And there are some common themes. So hopefully by sharing those common themes, we'll be able to help some other projects. I should stress, these aren't the ASF views. They're certainly not my employer's views. These are my personal impressions as somebody who's reviewed uh, well, let's see, we've had three, two and a half years, 200 project, yeah, must be over a thousand project reports easily by now. So um, it's very much what I've taken from looking at those reports. So let's look at some specifics. First of all, releases. Um, in my experience, releases are always catalysts for activity. Um, whatever the activity state of a project is, if you have a release, then you automatically get more activity. Users download the product, they install it, um, they might ask a few questions. If you're really lucky, they might report a bug. If you're extremely lucky, you might get a patch to go with it. But they're always a catalyst for activity. And without releases, it's like, well, what's the point? Um, I, I see projects that have been ticking along for, you know, getting on for over two years, and they haven't had a release. So, how is that going to encourage users? I mean, yes, there are some users that will download the source code and build it from source, but the majority of users don't do that. The majority of users want the binary. And if you're not doing releases, you're not providing the binaries, you're instantly cutting down a huge proportion of your user base. So releases are vitally important, and they really should be easy. Um, in the Tomcat project, we do monthly releases. Um, and I would say one of the most important, useful things we did as a project, and we did it about four or five years ago now, was take a long, hard look at the release process and do everything we could to automate it. Now, it's not completely automated. There are a few places where there are some manual steps, but they're very, very trivial. And to give you an idea, when I started on the Tomcat project, I tried to build, build it from source, and I was really pleased that I'd done it. It was three months later I realized I complete, built completely the wrong thing. Um, I was using a totally different version of one of the modules. And the first time I did a release, it took me days to figure out what I was doing. And releases were always a little bit painful. So we did some work on that. And about 18 months ago, we had a security vulnerability. So we had to release everything, which at the time was five versions. And it was just after I'd sent the notice out saying, yeah, the final version is available. It's all good to go. I was about to send the vulnerability announcement out. And somebody pipes up on the dev list. Um, but there's this regression. Uh, it's really, really badly broken. Nothing, oh, drat. Um, need to redo the whole lot. And it took me less than an hour to completely cancel the old releases, fix the problem, and re-roll five whole releases. But that was because of the time we put into the automation. And what I see as a director with some struggling projects is we'll say, look, if you could get a release out, that would really help. Yes, but we haven't got the time. And I think, but it shouldn't be that hard. Really, it really should be dead simple to get a release out. So what I would urge all projects to do is you know, work on your release process, make it as smooth as you possibly can, because whilst you might have lots of people available now, at some point in the future, as the project matures, as the user community and the development community does begin to shrink, as they inevitably will, then you still want to be able to get releases out. And the easier you can make the releases, the better it will be and the longer your project will be able to survive. 
Um, there, are, there are projects at, at Apache at the minute that are in the position where if they could get a release out, they could carry on. If they can't get a, they can't get a release out, so they're probably going to end up in the attic, and it, that's what's causing them effectively to be retired. And it's a really simple problem to solve if you solve it now when you've got the time to look at it. Um, next one I want to talk about is adding committers. Uh, as a general rule, I would say the lower the bar is, uh, the healthier the community. Um, taking an, another example from Apache, the Apache Subversion Project um, has a very, very low bar to committership. Uh, you come along, you provide a patch, um, provide a couple of patches, so there's a pretty good chance that somebody says, oh, right, great, here you go. But there's no point us applying your patch. You've got the commit bit, you apply it. Um, now, granted, they, they grant you permission to do that onto a narrow area, but they only enforce that socially, not technically, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, and it's really predicated on the basis that it's, look, all the source code is in version control. If you mess it up, we can undo it, and it's, it's not that big a deal. Um, back when I joined the Tomcat project, um, a little bit later I joined the PMC, which meant I could go back and look at the private archives. And while I was doing that, I came across the thread where they, the, the then PMC was currently was discussing me becoming a committer. And one of the comments was absolutely spot on. It was, yeah, most of his patches are fine. Occasionally, they're completely off the wall. It's like he doesn't have a clue what he's doing with Java. Um, actually, yes, that was correct. I didn't. Um, I only just started using Java, and I was literally teaching myself as I went along. Um, and there's one, one patch I submitted that had like a page of code to replicate searching for a string within another string. If only I'd looked at the API docs, and you know, it's already there. Um, but I just reproduced it because I didn't have the experience. But what the person who made that comment said was, but that's OK. If he messes up, I'll just veto it. Um, and they made me a committer. And as it happens, I didn't mess up, at least not that badly from that point onwards. But there was a recognition that it was OK to take a risk, because if I did do something wrong, you'd be able to revert it, you'd be able to undo the change. And the sorts of thing that caused me to raise my eyebrows and start getting worried is when I see projects starting things like, oh, we have a, new we have a checklist to decide whether or not we're going to offer to make somebody a committer. And normally what's happened is somebody has proposed somebody for, to be a committer, and somebody else says, oh, no, they're, they're not quite ready. They don't have enough experience. They, don't, they haven't done enough of this. They haven't done enough of that. And somebody else will say, yeah, but so-and-so never did that, and we made them a committer. And they'll end up being quite a long, protracted argument. And the solution, nine times out of 10, is I know. Let's document some nice, objective criteria as to what, what, where to set the bar as to whether somebody should be a committer or not. And it sounds like a great idea um, for about 30 seconds. And then you look at it a little bit more closely, because someone says, oh, you have to have at least 10 commits. Well, yes, there's a difference between 10 commits that each introduce a big new feature and 10 commits that each fix a tiny documentation patch. Oh, yeah, mm, OK. And what about the one-line commit, but it fixes a really critical bug that's taken you know, months of effort to track down? So, uh, well, let's say that it's got to be 10 substantive commits. Great, we're back to subjective language again, and the problem starts all over again, because the next time you try and propose a committer, you end up arguing over whether the commits are substantive or not. So it doesn't help. The other issue is that the lists of what you need to do to become a committer always get longer. They never get shorter. And eventually, they end up reading like, you know, must have contributed to the users list for at least a year, must have implemented at least three major features, must have fixed 20 bugs, must leap tall buildings with a single bound. I and mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, and it's nearly always a sign of a project that is being fairly insular, um, fairly self contained and not reaching out to the wide pool of people that could potentially contribute. So whenever I see committer checklists, um, my recommendation is always just throw it away. Um, in Tomcat, um, all of us, ha you know, we ha all have our own particular bars. I have a, my, my committer checklist, as it were, is fairly simple. If I see a patch coming from a name that I recognize, 
that probably means it's time to make them a committer. Because if they've done enough in the project that I recognize their name, and I, look at the, and I know the patch is going to be of a reasonable quality, that, that, they've probably done more than enough, actually, to become a committer. And that, that's as low as the barrier gets. So a couple of patches, and then we'll offer to make you a committer. Um, the other thing that I do look out for as a director is when projects haven't added committers for over a year. So that's, again, a sign of, well, you know, look, life gets in the way, people's priorities change, committers generally do tail off over time. If you're not constantly adding new committers, then at some point you're going to run out. So again, we look for projects that haven't been, at, haven't been adding to their community, aren't seeking to grow their community as a sign of something that might, might be going wrong. Again, it's not going to go wrong tomorrow, but long term, it does pose a risk. On the topic of committers, dominant committers is another potential issue. And this is something I worry about in Tomcat, because I, really, I'm the only Tomcat committer who is paid to work on Tomcat full time. And the, the other committers are paid to work on Tomcat, but they've, they've got other parts of their day job. My day job is pretty much 100% go and work on Tomcat. So something I always have at the back of my mind is it would be very easy for me to force stuff through on Tomcat the way I think it should be done. Um, and it re what it really comes down to is the speed of decision making. So what I look for, what I try and stop myself doing, and what I look for in other projects is if a project decision needs to be made, I mean, for example, Tomcat is talking about, shall we move from SVN to Git? Is that a decision that somebody says, oh, I think we should do this. 30 minutes later, all right, no objections, crack on, I'm going to do it. Or do they allow enough time for the discussion? Do they stay silent long enough for everybody else to have a, an equal say in the discussion? And one thing that it's very easy to do is, if you're on a project full time is instantly respond to every message on a topic that you care about. And you end up dominating the conversation. And again, it's stopping, you, know, you look, is that happening? If so, that's potentially a warning sign. Now, it's not necessarily a, um, go, going to cause harm to the project directly. Um, but what it can do is it can put other people off. And everybody can start looking towards that one person. Well, what does so-and-so think? What do they think? And you end up with a community that's always looking to one person for where should the project go, what should happen. And that's not really certainly at Apache how things are meant to work. It's meant to be collaborative. It's meant to be consensus-based. And you, what you really want is the people able to say, if they disagree with that one person, because they're not going to be right all the time, say, no, that's wrong. We don't want to do it like that. We want to do it like this. So as I'm looking at mailing lists for projects as I do their, their monthly reviews, what I'm looking for is who posts to the list most often and what are, sort of what are the proportions of, of those posts? And when I see somebody posting far more than anybody else, then I sort of tend to dig into it and look, so, you know, are they allowing time for other people to have those discussions or are they dominating the project? And if they, if they are dominating it and driving it, then it's a, well, maybe back off a bit, give other people a chance, give other people a voice, and try and encourage other people to um, step up. Right. So moving on from committers, I want to talk a little bit about tooling next. Um, and really, th this is related to process. And some of it stems from the time I spend um, volunteering with the infrastructure team. Because occasionally, what we'll get as the infrastructure team is a request that says, please, could you configure Jira with this special custom workflow? And we'll get about a three-page document that sets out each of the 20 steps an issue has to go through. Who's allowed to transition in the issue from what step stage to what stage at what point? And a whole bunch of rules. Um, and there's a couple of things I don't like about that. First of all, is it takes time for, uh, for, of our valuable infrastructure staff to actually set all of this stuff up. Secondly, experience tells me in about a week you're going to ask us to change it because it wasn't, it wasn't quite what you really meant or having tried it in practice doesn't quite work the way you want. And thirdly, at some point in the future on a semi-regular basis, you're going to need to do something to one of those issues that your workflow won't let you do. And the only way you'll be able be able to do it. So, uh, infrastructure, could you please change the state of this because we need to do X and we can't because the workflow rules don't let us. And it's ended up enforcing this rigid process, which I don't think particularly helps, at least not the technical enforcement. 
Um, it's fine to have a process, fine to have a standard way of doing things, but it's also good to have the flexibility. You know, sometimes it's nice to be able to break the rules. Um, so taking another example from Tomcat, uh, for a while, we worked on a review then commit basis, which meant that if you wanted to make a change to a release branch, you were required to propose that change, get three committers to vote on it, and that you had to have a majority of people saying, yes, that's an okay change to make before you could then actually apply that commit. But that was an entirely social enforcement. There was nothing technical um, ensuring that that happened. So occasionally, when we needed to bend the rules, it was easy. We just did the commit. So, oh, critical security issue. It's dead easy to reproduce. It's an obvious fix. We need to get the release out. Just do it. Um, and you, know, you do it with a, I'm breaking the rules. This is why I'm breaking the rules. If, any, if anybody, you know, we, we can go back and fix it later, but this is why I'm doing it, and crack on and do it. And it was never an issue. Um, whereas if we've got everything strictly enforced by technical means, then it makes all of that a lot more difficult. It slows you down. Um, it essentially gets in the way. You lose that flexibility. Um, and I'm seeing similar things with um, Jakarta EE as it's moved to Eclipse. Um, issues around um, every commit, at least in some of the projects I'm involved in, has to be reviewed by somebody else before it can be applied. And that's great if people are paying attention, but when they get distracted elsewhere, you end up with a pile of commits just building up because somebody who's got the time can do, can, and it's tr simple, true, you know, it's typo changes. It, it's nothing particularly complicated, but it's all built up because there's nobody to review it, and that's not a particularly motivating position to be in. Um, so again, the process is, is causing more harm than it's, that's in t it's intended to fix. Generally, Social controls work a lot better than people think they will. So the subversion project, as I said, they will, if they make you a com what they call, I think, is it partial committer or in initial committer or something? They say, you've got commit rights to this bit of the source tree. Actually, technically, any Apache committer has got commit rights to all of the subversion source tree. But what they rely on is the social convention that somebody isn't just going to walk in, make a commit, and walk out. They will, they will discuss it on the dev list, they will introduce it, and that works. Um, HTTPD's um, bug tracker, they use Bugzilla, and it's completely open. Anybody can open a bug, anybody can comment on a bug, anybody can close the bug, anybody can mark a bug as a duplicate. And what that allows is if you get somebody who's particular interest, well, okay, I'm not much of a coder, but you know, I really understand HTTPD and I know how to configure it. Um, so what they can do is they can go through the backlog and say, oh, this looks like an interesting bug. Can I reproduce it? Yes, he, I can reproduce it. Here's a better test case, a clearer test case. Or actually, no, I can't reproduce this. Oh, that's because it was fixed five versions ago. Right, we can close that bug. There's nothing stopping a new contributor diving in and doing that because the, the only security around Bugzilla is you need to have an account to do any of that, and anybody can get an account. And is Bugzilla filled with spam? No. Yes, we get the occasional spammer, but they're easy to deal with. Yes, we get the occasional person abusing it, but I think in, what, 15 years of administering Bugzilla for Apache, I've had to ban one user for being a pain in the neck. Um, and the benefit, you know, the cost of that, it took, what, about 30 seconds to do? May may maybe 10 minutes reading the emails to just convince myself that the project was right, that they did need to be banned. But other than that, it was... No, no hassle at all. And the benefits all those projects have got is that it's much easier for people to contribute, much easier for them to be able to get involved. So rigid processes are always things that I tend to raise an eyebrow about if they're, if they're strictly enforced. Processes are fine. You know, having stuff set out, you know, the way you like to do things, there'll be good reasons for that. But enforcing it, particularly via technical means and removing people's flexibility, that I see causing more problems than it solves. Now, this next one, might be an ASF specific one. It depends how you organize your open source projects. But at the ASF, everything is, is, should be consensus based. So if a decision needs to be made, so somebody says, right, on the dev list, we need to decide on what to do with this. This is what I think, or these are the options. What do other people think? You have a discussion, and you move towards a consensus. Occasionally, I see projects saying, oh, we've appointed XYZ as the project manager. I'm thinking, 
to do what exactly? And when you dig into it, it's like, oh, they, um, they prioritize the open issues in JIRA, or um, they decide when a release is going to happen, or what fixes are going to go into what release. And I'm, you know, that's just alarm bells all over the place for me. You know, that's not how an Apache project is meant to work. By all means, um, yeah, have a priority list for your Bugzilla issues, and you know, have the community um, vote on issues to decide what order the community would like them fixed. But developers, certainly at Apache, are meant to be individuals. So if somebody wants to work on something halfway down the list, that's what they work on. Um, having somebody saying, right, you do this, you do that, you do that, that's just not at all how a, um, a pack, certainly Apache community is meant to work. It should all be about scratching your own itch. So whenever I see project manager appearing on an Apache mailing list, that tends to um, sound an alarm bell for me. This next one is really hard to spot. Um, it's private communication. Um, it's, certainly it's hard to spot if you're outside of the community. You know, is there some core group of the community that's discussing things in private um, and then sort of announcing what's going to happen to, to the rest of the community, as it were? Now, for me, as a director reviewing projects, it's easy because I have access to all the private mail. So the first thing I tend to do is go and look at their private mailing lists. And what I hope I see is basically next to nothing. Um, a few personnel decisi decisions, so discussions as to should we invite this person as a, as a committer, they're held in private because you don't want to say, well, actually, um, we think they've got issues in this area, this area, and this area. You don't want to have those sorts of discussions in public. So those sorts of personnel issues, they're on the private mailing list. Other than that, hopefully it might be the um, odd email from the board saying it's time for your um, project your report, please can you produce it, and that goes to the private list just because it's the easiest way to get it in front of the right set of eyes, it's not a particularly private thing, but otherwise it should be pretty quiet. So when I look at a project and I see that their private list has got four times the volume of mail than the dev list, then I begin to think, okay, things are probably aren't heading in the right direction here. And again, there are examples where we have projects that are having huge discussions, huge amounts of energy, are pouring into what maybe isn't necessarily the most important issue of the day on the private list. Meanwhile, hardly anything's happening on the dev list and the project isn't moving forward. Um, I think my, my, my generally my recommendation is, look, there shouldn't be that much private mail. And if you're pouring energy into those sorts of discussions, maybe just stop, take a pause and think, yeah, is there something more productive we could be doing with this time? Um, is it better to spend three months arguing why the project isn't successful on the private list? Or would it have been better if we'd spent that energy on the dev list moving the project forward? But I know where I think the project, which one of those choices would lead to the project being in a better state. But obviously we, I can't direct projects on what to do, so of course we can just nudge them in the right direction. The one that's hardy for any, you know, anybody to identify is really is when communication starts happening off list. So that's when, rather than using the project's private mailing list, there's some other communication, whether it's happening within a company or um, on some private chat system or something, and it's not obvious to the community that, that it's happening and it's not accessible to the community. And it is really difficult to identify because you can only infer that it's happening because you'll, it'll be, you'll see things like you know, something will suddenly appear on the dev list. So, oh, here's the roadmap for the next 12 months. Okay, where did that come from? Because yeah, where, where was the discussion about that? That's a fairly obvious one. Um, or suddenly there's an announcement that the project's hold, holding a conference um, somewhere in three months' time, and here's the call for papers. And you're thinking, great, but this is the first we're hearing of the conference. Where was it decided that we wanted a conference, what the topic should be, where it was going to be, and all of that sort of stuff. You know, where's this call of paper, papers suddenly come from? Those are quite easy to spot, that clearly there's something going on off list and it needs to be brought back on list to get the broader community involved. The harder ones are when there's coordination going on between different committers. So, you can see that well, when you look at it more closely, you think, well, okay, they committed that feature, and then they committed that, and then that meant that person committed that. 
but when you look at the timing and the size of the commit, it looks like, well, well, they couldn't have written that without knowing that, but that wasn't committed until yesterday, and they committed that six hours later, but there's like 3,000 lines of code there, and it's, hor it's obviously dependent on that, so th you then realize that there's some sort of coordination and communication going on off list, which again, isn't allowing the entire community to be involved and to agree the direction as a whole, and that's quite difficult to spot. But, but again, what it does is it makes it harder for new people to get involved because there's obviously some, there's something going on that you're not, you can't quite put your finger on, that you're not, you can't quite see, that you're not, you don't quite understand, and then that's obviously quite off-putting as somebody who's new to the community. Um, Moving to, on to policy, and another one that might be a bit ASF specific, I call, call this policy bypass. Um, the ASF doesn't have that many policies, but the ones that we do are, are, are there for, for good reasons and lessons that have been learned from the past. And if, think, if the project's operating correctly, the policy shouldn't get in the way. Um, it's when I see conversations along, that essentially saying, how can we get around this policy? Or how can we phrase this thing that we want to do that isn't really conformant with the policy in such a way that the board thinks it is. Um, and that just raises a red flag for me. I mean, if the policy wording isn't clear, then yes, please, let's, let's fix it. If you genuinely think the policy is wrong, then please, let's discuss it. But if you're trying to work around the policy, then that's pr a pretty strong indication that you're doing something that you probably shouldn't be doing. And w that's the point to stop and sort of ask the question if it's, if it's not already explained, you know, wh why does the policy say this? What, what's behind it? What are we getting at? And then hopefully steer things in the right sort of direction. So have, taking those sort of individual examples of different things that raise fr flags, what I'd like to do is sort of take a couple of generalizations from that. Um, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, first of all, is technical controls versus social controls. As much as you can, my recommendation is keep the technical controls to a minimum. Technically, keep it as wide open as you can and use social norms, social conventions to um, manage sort of, you know, this is how the project typically do things, but retain that flexibility because that also lets you evolve things. If you have a rigid technical process, people have to do it that way and they're, they're, they, they can't um, evolve the process. They can't tweak it to make it a little better when they, when they spot a road bump. If it's all socially based, then things can, it's much more easy for things to gradually evolve over time. You can try something a bit different once and see whether it works, and you have those opportunities. So my strong recommendation is you know, social controls, not technical ones. Second one is barriers. Ge generally, the lower the barriers, the, the healthier the project will be. Um, we have a number of projects that have very low barriers to entry. They attract large numbers of committers and contributors and they are very healthy. The projects that are having problems tend to, it's not, a, it's, it's not a perfect correlation, but they tend to have higher barriers to entry. It's harder to become a committer. Um, there's more technical controls in place. So the lower the bar you can make the barriers, the easier it is for people to get involved. The easier it is for their they, to make their contribution, you to use their contribution, them to feel valued and hopefully contribute back again. So that brings me to the end of what I had. I'm looking to the MC. Do I have a couple of minutes for questions? I'm afraid I don't. So I'm around um, for the rest of the day. You'll find me up around the um, Apache Lounge. So if you do want to discuss anything that I've talked about today, tell me where I'm wrong. Please do come and find me, and I look forward to speaking to, with you. Thank you.